This is simply the tabernacle from the Old Testament, and we showed how those images of the four living creatures actually represented the four tribes that used to be set around the, the tabernacle. The right uh, it represents the east there, and uh, you can see uh, the Lion of Judah, and at the Lion of Judah, uh, that's the only doorway leading into the worship of God. Which is kind of cool because the word is very clear. There's only one way. God has made this so simple that you can not misunderstand it. The world says there's many different ways to God. God shows you a simple picture like that. Now you can't see the door, but if you saw the door, the, there's only one door leading in there, and you got to go by the way of the lion. And we know the lion of Judah is Jesus. There is no way to God except through Christ. I think we, we uh, saw this slide as well last week. But I brought up that every... This is the tabernacle, of course. Uh, you see the tabernacle uh, all the way up there to the right, the far right, but then all the rest of this stuff there, that's, that's the, um, the inner court of the tabernacle. And actually, the, the two areas here, when you think about the tabernacle, you actually got two pieces. One is the tabernacle where God dwells. You got the inside, underneath that tarp, is uh, actually it's like beaver skin or seal skin, but uh, underneath there is the holy place in the holy of holies, where God dwells and the worship goes on, and then all the rest of this is where the sacrificing was done. You know, they offered up sacrifices for their sins, and the priests did all priestly stuff, but everything. On, that wasn't inside the tabernacle represented something that was down, done to get you into the tabernacle. Okay, now of course you, people didn't actually go in the tabernacle except for the priests. But we'll, what we're going to see is the tabernacle actually represents what we just saw in the book of Revelation when John was told come up hither and he was standing before the throne. He was standing basically inside this ta inside the tabernacle. So the tabernacle, the, the box, or that rectangle rep building represents heaven, and all the rest of it represents what's done on the earth. Now if Jesus was the sacrifice, you can see actually about in the middle here, they've got the... Um, I'm not going to climb up there because of my leg, but if you go straight up from my finger, just straight up, you can see the, the uh, uh, altar, the brass altar. That re represents the altar where the sacrifice would be slain. And Jesus also had an altar, right? His altar was the cross. And he satisfied this prophetically by, by being nailed to his cross. But the point was, it wasn't done in heaven. He had to come down to the earth to give his life. That's why he had to come here in the first place, to give his life, to be the sacrifice. There's no sacrifices offered up in heaven. The sacrifices are offered up only once. And that is Christ. That's why it's wrong to repeatedly, some churches believe... They can repeatedly offer up Christ over and over and over and over and over. They believe when they, when they offer the communion, the Eucharist, and they hold it up, and that they're actually um, crucifying Christ again. Well, that really, that's not biblical. Jesus died once and for all. You, you don't keep killing Jesus over and over and over again. But what I want to bring out here... You see on the slide here, up the top, on the, on the uh, left, it says every detail was by design. The meaning hidden within the details, there's meaning hidden within the details of the camp. Look at uh, the bottom here. It says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7 through 8. He says, Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. That's a direct uh, quote 
of Psalm 40, 40 verse 7, where it's talking about the Messiah, Jesus, is saying, I come in the volume of the book of prophecies, it's written of me to do your will. So Jesus is coming to do and satisfy those the will of God. Now that will was to offer himself as a sacrifice. You can see on the tabernacle, most of the, that space, the inner court of the tabernacle, most of that space has to do with sacrifices, right? Sacrifices on the earth. The other part, the the rectangle itself, building, represents heaven, where God dwells. But look at this next verse, verse 8. It says, above when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein which are offered by the law. In other words, the New Testament book of Hebrews said that even though God went through all of these pains, all of this to set up this tabernacle, to set up this magnificent system of sacrifice and offering and forgiveness of sin, but he had no pleasure in it. And that's because there was something greater and that was the crucifixion of or the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And in Hebrews, uh, you can see right here at the bottom, the rest of these we've already covered on the previous slide. Uh, I could look at the picture here and show you there. You see, you see the right there. There's only one entrance. Okay, that's that really. When Jesus said, "I am the way, the truth." The light, oh, in fact, he calls himself the door. No man goes to the Father except through me. That's what he was representing. There's only one door. But what I want to point out here is this verse here, where he says, Moses was, and this is from Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5, Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. Of course, Moses didn't actually make the tabernacle. He gave orders to have it built. And then God by the Holy Spirit, uh, bless some individuals to have that ability to do that. But it says here, For see, saith he, thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. What's important about that is what, what God is saying is, make sure you do everything exactly the way I've told you to. Exactly the way I showed you, exactly according to the pattern in heaven. What was, what do you mean, the pattern in heaven? Oh, wait a minute. Weren't, when we opened that book, weren't we in heaven? We were there with John. We were just in heaven. We saw the cherubim, we saw God on the throne, we saw the seven burning lamps in front of the throne, we saw the 24 elders, and he said here, make all things according to the pattern, the pattern of heaven. And so, what we have in the tabernacle, everything that we have, the details, we see repeated again in the reality in the book of Revelation. And that's why it is so important that every detail was done exactly as God had shown. Let's, here you can see that, again, this is the only door that leads into the... Now, yeah, you can't really tell the, the length of the tabernacle from this angle, but you, this is the door that leads in there. This... Uh, and here you, uh, you can see the two priests standing by the brazen laver here, which was filled with water. They could wash. And then, again, this is the, um, the actual tabernacle. I want to point out, because I don't have it in another slide, but you see this, there's a white linen. You see the white linen? Because what we've done is we've rolled away some of that uh, covering and you can see the white rain, uh, raiment here. It's important because the, um, the tabernacle is actually covered with three layers. The outside layer, uh, obviously you have to have something waterproof sat outside, right? And so what they had was some say beaver skin, some say seal skin. But it, it, it reflected, the water bounced off of it. 
kept the water out. So on the outside you had like a, the animal gave his life, yeah. right? He had to give his life to be the, so it represents Christ, you see that? And you have the covering, but the other side, what do you have on the other side of the skin? Blood, yeah. right? So you see how perfectly it represents the sacrifice of Christ. And then the next layer was white linen which represented the righteousness of Christ. Okay, and we'll, we'll see the third one as well. It's interesting that there's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as well. But, um, badger skin, yeah, badger skin, beaver skin, seal skin. It depends what commentary you read. Yeah. Remember, this, they walked around the wilderness for 40 years. Taking it down and putting it back up. Take, Pastor, I have been involved with new churches, new, new startups, where you go, you assemble all the chairs, you know, maybe you're renting a school, you put it all up, you have the service, and then you put it all down. Oh, what if you have a Sunday night service? You go, you put it all up, take it all down. Wednesday night, you put it all up, take it all down, right? Oh, we have a special song service on Saturday. Put it all That gets old in a hurry. You don't know how good it is to be able to come here on Sunday and say the chairs are already there. To have your own place. It's great to have your own place to worship. But this had to come down... You know, they, they would have got been, gotten to the promised land a long time ago had they not have been disobedient and uh, obedient in their faith. What you see here, of course, you got like some, you got uh, some sacrificial animals up there at the top here. I think you got two people up there, two priests. Um, here's where the altar is, where they would. Do you, you, you see the, um, there's a platform that comes up on an angle. That, 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 um, that altar was pretty large. But for the priest to put that sacrifice up there, actually it would take more than one, but there was a, a, a diagonal platform so that they could carry the sacrifice and throw it up there. They did more than, more than one at a time. And there were poles here as well that you could carry that thing when they moved. Of course, they got all bloody, and, and, and they couldn't enter, the priests could not enter into here with, with blood on them. Uh, after that, uh, offering those sacrifices, they had this uh, bronze laver filled with water to wash. All this was outside. This, this is called the inner court. When you had the temple, you had an inner court and an outer court. But here was just the inner court. But then when you got into here, this was the holy place. You had to be a priest to get in there. Did you know it's the same thing today? None of you are going into heaven unless you're a priest. But he has made us all kings and priests through the blood, right? That's what he's called. So once again, we have an argument for or, or a response to anyone to say, well, you know, I can be a Buddhist and still go to heaven. Good luck. If you're not washed in the blood of Christ, how are you going to get in, into heaven? There's only one door and you've got to be a priest. You know, only the high priest could get the part that's still covered up that was considered the Holy of Holies. Because here you can see all the, uh, all the equipment here. You had the bronze altar for sacrifice. I've labeled it here. The bronze laver of water for cleaning. Over here, when you, when you first walk into, the, into the, uh, the, the holy place, on the left-hand side right here, it's not... Uh, Oh yeah, I got it. I got it listed up there. There was a menorah, seven golden stem lampstand right up here, and then over here the twelve loaves of unleavened showbread. Over here the altar of incense. So that consisted of the holy place, and then in the holy of holies, all you had was the ark of the covenant. And there was this thing on top of the Ark of the Covenant. You had two cherubim that were overseeing what they called the mercy seat. And the blood would be applied on the Day of Atonement onto the mercy seat by the high priest. All this symbolism is in the book of Revelation. Now, of course, you're not going to see the bronze altar in the book of Revelation 
because we actually are in here. So you, you, you shouldn't expect to see anything bronze. That's for the earth. And the work was done by Jesus, right? But the first thing you do see in Revelation 1, 2, and 3, you see a seven golden candlestick. Right? When you get to chapter 4, it becomes apparent, not only do we still see the seven golden candlestick in heaven, but we look to the other side, if we were in the tabernacle, what would we see? The twelve loaves of showbread, right? They were unleavened bread, and they represented the twelve tribes of Israel. And the only people that could eat of it, partake of that bread, were the priests. Yeah. Okay? You, no, normal, not everyday people couldn't eat of that. But what do we see when we get into heaven? We see the 24 thrones. So, what I believe, I, I think where the Holy Spirit is leading on this, is that the 24 thrones, whatever that 12, those 12 pieces of bread represented and we know it represented the 12 tribes of Israel but only the priests could eat it right so only the priests served inside that so those 24 thrones and those 24 elders they represent the same thing as the show bread notice also that that candlestick was completely gold I mean complete complete gold it's solid gold. In fact, it was, uh, it was shaped out of one piece. I don't know how they did it. That's a, that's a great mystery. They just pounded it and pounded it into shape. And it wasn't like today you would just get a piece and you would, you would pour the gold into a mold or something. That's not what they did. They beat that thing. <clears throat> now that uh, table of showbread, that was, that was wood, but it was covered. It was overlaid with gold. And it, the candlestick kind of stands out because it's showing the divinity. As opposed to that table of showbread, it was actually wood covered with gold. And those 24 elders are from the earth. I believe they're redeemed men and women. You know, when you say men, I'm saying mankind. We redeem men. And they're also, they're, but they've been covered with the glory of God and the gold. And then in the middle here, you had the altar of incense. We haven't seen that yet. But when we get to Revelation chapter 8, you'll see a priest standing here at the altar of incense. And the prayers and the incense is ascending before God. Can you see the symbolism I mean, am I am I just crazy, or, or is this obvious? It's it's so obvious, isn't it? And the priest is standing right before the judgment. But of course, the Ark of the Covenant. Where do we see? we actually see the Ark of the Covenant in the Book of Revelation later on? We'll, we'll see it when we get there. But right now, as we're standing in Revelation chapter four, we look upon the throne. Because the one sitting on the throne is the one sitting on the mercy seat. And around his throne is cherubim. Yep. And around the mercy seat are cherubim. Right? So you can see how all this represents heaven itself, right? And, of course, here's, here's where I showed you that you had that outer skin, okay? And I believe that represents the humanity of Christ. Oh, you can actually see the white. See, you can actually see the white uh, here. You can make it out underneath, the, which represents the righteousness of Christ. And there was also this blue linen cl uh, cloth underneath both. And it had the blue color represented the sky, and you had all these cherubim that were sewn into the fabric. So when the priest would go into that place, now if the, if the candlestick was, if, if, if there was no light, I mean it would be pitch black. 
<clears throat> the covering on the tabernacle was like this thick. Yeah. It, was, it was so dark in there. There was no light. But when the candle sli- that candlestick showed the light, and everything, all the furniture in there was gold, so there was shine all over the place, and all over the walls were these cherubim. And when we saw the throne in chapter 4, what did we see? Around the throne, we see all these angels along with the cherubim. We don't know exactly. I mean, this is what somebody, they actually have a model and they've, uh, they've sewn these cherubim. We know cherubim were on there, but we don't know what they looked like. We don't have the original here. But we do know from the details in the book the scriptures that that's what it had. You can see that the whole thing was gold. The whole thing was gold. Can you imagine what this thing was worth? And we know that God dwells in this holy, holy of holies, in the holy place in heaven. And there's this, there was this blue linen cloth that separated the tabernacle itself from the rest of the world, right? And what do we have if we look up in the sky in the morning? We have a blue sky, which God is up there in his holy place, right? And nobody gets in that holy place except they come through the door and they're washed in the blood and they're a priest, right? And this just shows the... uh, you know, it just shows the uh, animals are getting ready for sacrifice. You, you can see how huge that uh, that altar was. That's where they offered up all those sacrifices. And uh, it was huge. Could you imagine this was your job? You know, you read the, you read the scripture, and, and I, I got the idea that when I read it initially, I thought, wow, what an easy job. You know, everybody else had to do work. And here these guys, you know, they offer up a sacrifice. Could you imagine taking a steer and throwing it, lifting it and throwing it all day long? All day. These guys must have been muscular. I mean, I couldn't do that kind of work all day long. Well, the boat was still alive when it took them on the owner. Oh, they would slice their throat. They'd do the kosher cure or kill. How many have heard of kosher kill, by the way? So the animal wouldn't struggle. So anyway, let's go see some more things here. Here, here is a kind of a close-up of the what the brazen altar looked, or brazen, uh, the uh, brazen uh, laver, and you can see the water. Now, this, this is uh, there's an illusion in uh, Corinthians where Paul talks about a person looking in, into the um, to the mirror and seeing themselves. And then going back away and forgetting what they looked like. Remember that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When these priests looked in the water, that was all bronze, right? And what did it do? It, it was water on top. It reflected. Water reflects anyway, right? Is this bright? And you had the sun up there. It reflect. You, the guy would see himself. Constantly see himself. What did that do? It reminded him of his humanity, right? It also represents, there's two things we do on the earth. Now, some places, you know, some churches teaches us all these different things that you're supposed to do, all these different sacraments or whatever. And they, different people have got different ideas, but there's really only two things. You must be born again, and Jesus did that. You can't make yourself born again. Only he can be the sacrifice. And the other thing is, you'd be, you'd be baptized. When they had the temple, they built this laver so that it was so huge, it was like this gigantic swimming pool. And instead of washing, the priest would actually start at one side, and he would walk, and it would go deeper and deeper, and actually get in the middle, it was over his head. And then he would come out the other end. So he was completely covered in water. But of course, they couldn't do that. They couldn't have it that big if this thing was portable. This was meant to be portable. Here we have this, uh, what this uh, menorah uh, probably looked like uh, based upon... Now, now, obviously, somebody constructed this based upon what's written and 
We don't know if it's exactly like this. You may look on the internet and see something uh, a little different. But um, this is a good picture. And the next slide shows the showbread here. And again, we talked about the, the covering of gold. But um, it's unleavened bread. And uh, then uh, the next one is that altar of incense. This one has like a cover on it. I don't know if the original had a cover or not, but um, you can see the incense going up. The thing that was kind of neat about this altar of incense was they would go, the priest would go out, and before they offered up the incense, they would go to the brazen altar where they offered the sacrifices, and they would take the red hot coals in a bucket, carry them in there, and put those coals in there to burn the incense. So the coals had to have been through the sacrificial blood before the incense could be raised up. That's what the Word of God says about you. The only, in, in other words, if you're, not, if you're not a child of God, the only prayer God will listen to is save me. God save me. Yeah. And then he'll direct you how to do it. But he has no obligation to save you if you're not his child. He gives you directions how to, how to get there. Once again, people say, well, all, all religions are alike. Uh, the largest religion today may be, now they, they're still debatable whether it's Christianity or Islam. Uh, the reason Islam's grown so, so fast is they have, lots of them have multiple wives. They could have seven, one guy could have 17 children. And then a lot of Christians, you know, Christian families don't even have children anymore. You know, a, lot of, a lot of people don't even have, if they get married, they don't even have children. And you've got to do what you're going to do. But uh, I, do, I do believe that that command, be fruitful and multiply, is still God's will. Because if we don't keep producing, we're not going to have any Christians pretty soon. You can see another view. Now, here... Here we have a, here's a, a priest standing next to the seven golden candlestick here. Uh, this is just a regular priest. Here is the high priest. And you can see he, he's dressed much different. And on his chest here, we'll see in a minute, but he's got these 12 gems that are on his chest. This is, you can see the cherubim on the curtain here. And behind there is where the tabernacle, that's where God dwells, behind there, behind that, behind that uh, curtain. The curtain, again, was like this thick, and that, that's the curtain, and it went way, I mean, way up. And that's the curtain that was torn when Jesus hung on the cross. He said, it is finished. It torn from the top down. It didn't tear all the way. It tore top down, and it meant that the way of access to to God had been opened up. The next next one is a ni it's a nice picture of the uh, the Ark of the Covenant, and it shows us a ball of fire there, if you will, which is supposed to represent God's presence. Now I'm not saying there was a ball sitting there, but God, we know God's presence sat in between the cherubim on the mercy seat. We don't really know what the high priest saw. So I'm not saying that that picture is completely accurate, but I sure would have liked to have been there to see it, but I'd rather see the throne that John saw up there in Revelation 4. And here you can see a better picture of the high priest. This is just a mannequin. It's not a real person here, but you can uh, see how, how he's kind of dressed there. He's got the 12 stone. They're kind of modeling their clothes in case you want to buy it, I guess. That's what they look like. Next slide has the high priest again, a blow up, and you can we keep getting closer and closer. You know, on his shoulders he also had six of the tribes on each shoulder. The reason was when we, when he went before God, he had he re, all those stones. They represented the twelve tribes of Israel. He had six six on this side and six on this side, and he was carrying Israel upon his shoulders. What did Christ do with his cross? carried mankind on his shoulders, right? And on his heart, before God, he brought, whenever he went into God's presence, he brought the whole uh, people of God before him. And the next slide shows us behind that curtain, you know, how many saw the Wizard of Oz? And there was that guy behind the curtain working all those controls. Well, here there was no guy behind the curtain, there was just the ark. 
Okay. Also, there, you know, the high priest, they used to, um, uh, I heard, now I don't know if, I, I can't prove that it's factual, but I heard that they used to tie a rope around his ankle, and they had, he had bells on his, um, at the end of his um, dress, and as he walked around, these little bells would make a sound, but if he went into the presence of God and he had sin, if he didn't have repented of the sin, there was, God would slay him dead. And he told him he would. He would kill him if he went in before him and he, he was not in a proper attitude to meet up with him. I mean, he had a big responsibility. There was only one high priest. And, of course, when God killed him, if God killed him off, there would be another one. Or if he died, we'd have to have another one. But... There's only one high priest for us. There can't be another. We're not looking for any prophet to come. We're not, we're not looking like... How many heard of Mary Baker Eddy? Yep. Okay, Mary Baker Eddy in the 1800s, she founded the... Uh, what was it? Uh, what's the name of that organization? Uh, came to be the new Christ, the female version of Christ. Christian what was it? Christian yeah, science. yeah, Christian science. Yeah, yeah, Christian science. Yeah, that's what it was. No, Scientology is. They also have a reading room. Yeah, but you, yes, you're right. Um, so I wouldn't, you know, recommend you go there because they're, you know, they have a whole twist of the the whole. Well, they they're actually worshiping Mary Baker Eddy, really. Or you can you can actually see these. Uh, the, the seven spirits, the seven flames here better. You can actually see everything better. In fact, you can even make out, we haven't gotten there yet until we, uh, until we get to the fifth chapter, but you can see he's, ho he's actually holding a scroll in his hand on the throne, if you can make that out up there. Uh, there was this um, ritual that they did every day in, in the tabernacle or in the temple. There were five things that they did every morning. Now, it's amazing, but the book of Revelation corresponds to this step by step by step. Watch this. Number one, the first thing they did was clean the menorah. It's the first thing they did in the morning. They went in there, and the priest cleaned the menorah. You, kept, you had to keep it clean because they had to keep the lights burning. In Revelation chapter 2 and 3, what did we see? Cleaning the menorah. Remember, he kept saying the menorah was the churches. He kept saying to the churches, repent, 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 right? He was, he was, he was telling us, clean the menorah. So that was the first thing. And we see that right away in the book of Revelation. The next, then after that was done, the second thing, they opened up the gates. Remember, there was, um, you can see it here on the left. You can see the gate opened up. There was only one entrance to the tabernacle. Well, what do we see in the book of Revelation? After we see the cleaning of the menorah, we see the door opened up in heaven. Right? The doors opened up. Open up the gates. And that's Revelation 4.1. Then we see in Revelation 5.8, we see exactly what the, it was the next thing they did, offering of the incense. And we see that in the book of Revelation. Revelation 5.8, we see the uh, elders were uh, offering the incense, in fact. Um, we see in Revelation 5, 6, a lamb offered up as a sacrifice. The lamb approaches God. And then, of course, uh, at the, uh, towards the end of Revelation 5, which we didn't read, by the way, we see uh, the worship of God. The same thing happened every day, every day, every day. And here we see it repeated in the book of Revelation. I don't know if you're getting a, 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 a hint of why Satan attacks this book so much. When, when God said to see that you make everything according to pattern, it's because the meaning that, that it represented would be carried on to give us this revelation when we began, you know, when we got to this point and we could see what it, all this represented. 